Welcome. I'm Lynn Singer, Deputy Provost and Vice President for Academic Programs here at Case Western Reserve. And I'm thrilled to welcome this large group today who have come out to hear our speaker. Uh, this morning we'll be hearing a presentation on Beyond Bias and Barriers with Dr. Joan Stites, a report on a report. And I'd really like to thank, first of all, uh, Dr. Stites for staying over uh, from her lecture yesterday, and also the many sponsors of today's luncheon uh, that have made this afternoon possible. First of all, Dr. Kristen Baker and the graduate students in the Center for RNA Molecular Biology. Thank you for bringing Dr. Stites here and for suggesting that we ask her to talk about her work on this wonderful report. Also, Dr. Michael Weiss, chair of the Department of Chemistry, Biochemistry, has helped sponsor this. The WISER group, the Women in Science and Engineering Roundtable, led by Mary Rouse. Is Mary here today? Because every graduate student should get involved with this group. We have a very large group now, and it's been a very successful program uh, now that Mary's taken the helm. Also sponsored by the Floristone Mather Center for Women and its director, Dr. Dorothy Miller. And also what we're calling the ACES Plus program, which continues the programs begun at the university through the National Science Foundation Advanced Program, which ended last year. And thanks to the uh, sponsorship of our president, Dr. Barbara Snyder, we've been able to continue many of those programs. And I urge you to take, get a hold of, through Sharon Burke and uh, Amanda Schaefer, we have a little flyer that outlines some of the programs that are still going on, some for faculty, some for students like Weiser. Uh, we also, especially I'd like you to note the executive coaching program and the hotline coaching uh, program that's been very valuable to, to faculty members who may have a specific question coming up and a specific item that they'd like to have some advice on. We also have advanced opportunity grants continuing and other programs, so please take a look at this. As you remember, uh, the goals for our NSF advanced program were accountability, transparency, equity, and participation of all faculty members across the university, hopefully leading to the advancement of women and underrepresented minorities in science and engineering on this campus. So we also, I'm very pleased to introduce right now uh, Dr. Pamela Davis, Dean of our Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, who will introduce our speaker today, and who has also broken a few barriers herself over the last couple of years, being our first women de woman <laughs> dean of the School of Medicine. You're not two people yet, but we're, we're hoping for more, right? Yeah. <laughs> she, she works enough for three people, we'll so. <laughs> For a minute, I thought it was how much weight I gave. <laughs> uh, I, ap I appreciate the opportunity, and it's a great honor to welcome Dr. Joan Stites uh, to our, both to our campus and to this lecture. Uh, Dr. Stites is the Sterling Professor of Molecular uh, Biophysics and Biochemistry at Yale, and she has been a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator from 1986 until the present day. She received her PhD in molecular biology and biochemistry from Harvard, joined the faculty at Yale in 1970, and there she be began groundbreaking research on the function of small nuclear ribonucleoproteins in pre-mRNA splicing. You can see why the RNA Center graduate students really wanted her to come. Her primary interest is in the multiple roles, roles played by small RNA protein complexes in gene expression in vertebrate cells and we hope that some of her research may lead new ins to new insights in lupus. <laughs> Dr. Stites is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and has received the RNA Society Lifetime Achievement Award. She has honorary degrees from everywhere you ever want to graduate from. <laughs> <laughs> in addition to her other honors and awards, she's, uh, she was part of the committee that produced the 2007 report, Beyond Bias and Barriers, that she's going to talk with us about today. This pivotal report busts myths and proposes recommendations that promise to transform our academic institutions. We hope to improve the working environment for women and, and men, and also to profoundly enhance our nation's science and engineering talent pool. 
But before Dr. Stites gets started on her report, uh, on the report, I'd like to share a more personal part of her background with you that will explain why she saw fit to take on the task of helping write this report, which is no mean feat. As a student in the 1960s, she assisted senior scientists in the laboratories at the Max Planck Institute in Germany and at MIT, where she was befriended by James D. Watson, co-discoverer of the DNA double helix. Stites said she never imagined herself as a top flight scientist because she convinced herself she was not devoted enough to research to spend the grueling nights and weekends in the laboratory. What's more, she was discouraged by the lack of female role models working as senior scientists and full professors. When I was a graduate student, she says, there are no women professors in the biological sciences at any major university. Consequently, I never envisioned myself being where I am today, never thought I would be on the faculty of a prominent university. I really thought I'd be a research associate in someone's lab, a man's, of course. Fortunately for us, she took a summer job in another laboratory under the supervision of cell biologist Joseph Gall, who set her up with her own research project to determine whether ciliary basal bodies from the protozoan, protozoan tetrahymen uh, pyroformis contained nucleic acid, a reasonable question since mitochondria had just been shown to possess their own complement of DNA. In 1963, she became the sole woman in a class of 10 to begin graduate studies in biochemistry and molecular biology at Harvard, first female graduate student to work under uh, Watson's guidance. With all that in mind, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Stites to share her information about this report. Wow, this is great. So I'm so glad. I always take the opportunity to give this talk, which I've given a number of times, if there are people who want to listen. And I've had such a wonderful time visiting here because of the RNA biology and because of all the wonderful science. So uh, as you've heard, what I'm going to talk about is a report, uh, which actually came out two and a half years ago in September of 2006. And it turns out that being on the committee that wrote this report was really one of the most interesting and I would say exhilarating experiences that I've ever had uh, related to a career in science. Uh, so what I want to do is first of all tell you about the situation that engendered the creation of the committee that wrote the report, a little bit about how the committee operated and what we did, and then, of course, the findings of the report and the recommendations of the report in the hopes, and I hope to do this quickly enough so that we can have a wonderful discussion uh, thereafter. Um, let me uh, go on with first the good news about women in science. Only oh, other thing that I, I knew I was forgetting something that I do want to say. Although the report basically was looking at women in academic science departments, if you think about it, and I found it applies equally to women in medicine, whether they're doing clinical or scientific research. So being in a medical school, this is relevant for you as well. Uh, so the good news about women in science, as you see from the graphs here, are that the numbers that are graduating with PhDs have steadily increased over the 30 years until about five years ago. And particularly in the life and social sciences, we're now at parity uh, in terms of the population of women versus men getting degrees. But as you all know, uh, the problem is what happens thereafter. And even though for over 30 years women have made up more than 30% of the PhDs uh, and over 20% in the life sciences, when we look at the numbers of full professors in these disciplines at universities, it's around 15% level. So it's gotten that far, but it hasn't gone any farther. And then, of course, if we think about women from um, minority backgrounds, racial or ethnic, uh, they're almost totally absence, almost total isolation. So 
one way of looking at this is in this wonderful scissors graph that comes from an article written by Carla Neugebauer, another RNA scientist uh, in, in PLOS biology. And she specifically here is talking about German science. But if you think about this, again, at PhD level, there's sort of parity. If you think of this as postdocs, if you think of habilitation as assistant professors, and then professors, pretty much the same thing. That representation of men increases at every single one of these steps, and the representation of women decreases. So um, makes me think of this wonderful sculptor by Martin per year, and of course, he made the sculpture with a different sort of idea in mind. He's a black sculptor uh, <coughs> who resides in Texas, recently had an uh, exhibit at the Guggenheim in New York. But um, what you have is a ladder that seems to be sort of endless, finally ending in this context. You can think of a, a glass ceiling or perhaps a polycarbonate ceiling. <laughs> But it's a long way up there. And the amazing thing about the sculpture is it turns out that the first rung of the ladder is about this far off the ground. So just getting on the first rung is tough. And then there's a long way to go. So um, now let me start talking about the report. So the immediate impetus for the report was obviously the comments that were made by Larry Summers, then president of Harvard in January of 2005. And here I will paraphrase, and I hope nobody gets me on the details. Basically what Summers said was that he thought there were few women on faculties in science and mathematics for three reasons. Uh, women's brains weren't really up to it. Um, women didn't want to work hard enough to be successful in uh, science and mathematics. And thirdly, that there might be a little bit of sort of social or cultural influence that underlying the situation. And as a result of that, what happened was that the National Academy of Sciences, which issues reports through the National Research Council, um, there's a committee there called COSAPUP, which is the Committee on S Science, Engineering, and Public Policy, that many of the reports that are written by the National Academy of Sciences are commissioned by other organizations, but the COSAPUP is the committee where they decide what reports they want to write. And they decided that a report should be written on this area Namely, first to question whether what Larry Summers had said was really true, according to all the scientific research that's gone on in cognitive psychology and in these various relevant areas. And then secondly, to figure out what the situation really was and what could be done about the situation. And so um, the charge to the committee then was this, as I just said, to assess the real research literature on gender issues and try to figure out what, what the facts really were according to current understanding and analysis. Then to look at our institutions of higher learning and ask what the practices are and the cultures are that might contribute to the situation to figure out whether there are any effective practices to keep women in these careers. And finally, um, first of all, to get them into them and second of all, to keep to the keep them there, and then finally to come up with findings of all of this analysis and make some recommendations about things that might be changed in terms of what we're doing in the future that might impact the situation for, for the better. Um, the committee, this is a list of people who are on the committee, uh, was headed by Donna Shalala, who was the Secretary of Health and Human Services in the Clinton administration. She's now at the president of the University of Miami. Um, there are, if you look at this list, there are five current or former university heads. Um, on, on the committee, there were, science was represented in all sorts of different disciplines from computer science and cognitive science to physics and, and life sciences. 
many of the people on this committee, not me, but many of the others, it was a very distinguished group of people, had been instrumental at their own institutions or nationally in doing things, for instance, with advance grants to further the cause of women in science. Uh, Denise Denton, who was chancellor of the University of California at Santa Cruz, you may remember, she was the woman who threw herself off the 42nd floor of some hotel in San Francisco because she was being hounded by the California press and the students at the University of Santa Cruz. Um, and uh, tragically, she was a very powerful force on the committee before she committed suicide, before the report actually was issued. And it's a very, very great loss. So the report was dedicated to her. And I actually have on the desktop of my computer, if anybody wants it, a fabulous article about the situation that she encountered and what probably led to her, her suicide. Um, OK, so it was a very diverse group of people. And what the committee actually did was Donna Shalala was a fabulous sort of chair of the committee. And what we did was to convene a couple of open meetings where we had experts come in who knew about cognitive psychology and sociology and talk about aspects of the situation and what the current <laughs> research really shows. And then, as many of you may know, but not everybody knows, when a committee like this writes a report. It isn't that the people on the committee sat down and took a pencil and wrote the sentences. What happens is a professional writer, and we had two superb people, actually write the report. And what the committee does is go over drafts of the report. It reorganizes things. It sets up the outline clearly. It instructs these people as to what to write. But they actually do the writing. And so we had a number of really, really fun, interesting conference calls with all the members of the committee after bits of the report were written. And Donna, as I said, was absolutely fabulous at directing these and making them efficient. And we got the report out in record time. Um, so, so that's how it all happened. Um, now, so the findings of the report I'm going to go through in the form of evidence refuting commonly held beliefs about women in science and engineering. So what we're going to see is first the belief, for instance, women are not as good in mathematics as men, and then what the current findings are with respect to that particular um, commonly held notion. So this, this one's interesting. So it's very clear. There's lots of literature out there that in terms of mathematical ability and achievement, at least at the high school level, women are perfectly equivalent to men. What's interesting, if you do a bell curve of mathematical ability, the one for men is they both peak at the same point. But the one for men has broader tails, so they're both more geniuses and more uh, idiots in the male population <laughs> than there are in the female population. But I think we all appreciate is you don't have to be a genius to succeed in science. What you have to be is you know, relatively smart. So clearly, there's no st statistically significant difference there. OK. Um, it's only a matter of time until the proportion of women on faculties increases. And I showed you right at the beginning. Uh, the data that say that even though we've had a lot of women in the pipeline for many, many years, the situation of representation of full professors at universities has not gotten there. So there are other things going on. Um, women are not as competitive and don't want jobs in academe. Well, if you poll graduate students at the time that they enter graduate school, um, and actually, I talked to the graduate students I had dinner with last night about this. Um, an equivalent number of women and men feel that they would like to go into academia, and then things start happening, so we get this scissors effect that I talked about earlier. So that's, that's interesting. Um, OK, affirmative action singles out uh, women and minorities, and will solve the problem. And of course, what you all know is that it's illegal to choose people on the basis of race or sex. Um, what affirmative action actually is about is broadening the pool and looking at more quali potentially qualified individuals to make sure that they're included in the consideration for positions and for advancement. 
this one is one that I absolutely love. Yes. Academia is a meritocracy. The problem is all the people in academia are people. And people come with baggage. No matter what you are, whether you're a scientist or something else, you come with all sorts of biases that you mostly don't know you have. And when you're then confronted with decision making, especially if either time or information is short. What happens is people tend to choose people like themselves. So if we're starting out with white males, what we tend to end up with is white males. Uh, women faculty are less productive than men. This is also an interesting one. So studies that were done in the mid-90s, in fact, did show that women faculty's publication records usually were slightly smaller than men's. But that, the more recent studies show that they're, they're more or less equivalent. It's also true that at the NIH studies about NIH grants that women get the same you know, percentage-wise grants as men. One thing that I find very interesting, however, is that women ask for 20% less on their grants than men do. So if we had more women in the pool, we'd have more money to go around from NIH. <laughs> OK, women are more interested in family than in careers. And here we know that you know, despite severe conflicts, uh, many women have sort of managed to sort of pull it together and figure out how to do it and have succeeded in science, and we just need to make it a little bit easier for more people to do this. Um, oh, let me go back to this one because um, there's another fact here that's very interesting. Um, it's true that women take off more time at the early stages of their career for caregiving. But over a lifetime, the data say that men take off more sick leave than women do. Uh, changing the rules means that standards of excellence will be lowered. And in fact, studies that have been done show that if, you, if a diverse set of people is set down to tackle a problem, you come up with more creative solutions. So the more diversity that you have, both in terms of of sex and in terms of race and so on, the more likely you are to come up with real solutions. So um, diversity, in fact, is a good thing and should not lower the standards of excellence. Uh, the system is currently configured, has worked well in the past. Um, I think all of you feel like I do, like the rest of the world is catching up to this nation scientifically and technically, so the global argument here very definitely comes in, and unless we change and include more of the talented and qualified people, we're going to get left in the dust. So basically, then, the conclusions and the findings is that it's not a lack of talent, but things about the structure of our institutions, the structure of academia, and unintentional biases that are hindering the, um, the equity of women in uh, academic science, engineering, and medicine. So what I found most interesting about being part of this report and reading all the primary research that's gone into it was what I realized about this subject of unintentional bias. And I want to spend a little bit of time on this, although I don't do it nearly as well as the cognitive scientists do. Um, so it turns out that nowadays it's not usually big sort of overt things, but a lot of little things that happen differentially to women versus men that sort of tend to add up and amount to discouraging people to going forward to the next step. So the small advantage disadvantages accumulate. And particularly when you get uh, farther on in, in the profession, you become more and more isolated and uh, so in a sense, the problem of not enough women is part of the problem itself. It's sort of self-accelerating and feeds on itself. So I think that's the take home from this slide. Um, there's a lot of research out there that addresses um, in cognitive psychology, which is a lot of fun to read about and 
and have people who really do it talk to you about what they found and the tests that they've used. And some of you maybe have been experienced some of these tests. Uh, but just to go through the points that are made here on the average, people are less likely to hire a woman or man. For instance, there was a study done in Sweden on, uh, they were giving postdoctoral fellowships and they went back and looked at the data over a 10 year period and found out that in order for a woman to get a fellowship, she had to have twice as many publications on average as a man. Um, you all know about the famous experiments where a scientific paper has been taken and the names at the top have been erased and substituted either with all men's names or all women's names and then given to a bunch of graduate students or undergraduates and they've been asked to say which, which paper is better and it's always the one with the, men, the men's names at the top that get, get ranked as better. And I said this before, that either when information or time is scarce, people are much more likely, and there are all sorts of studies that show this, to give the benefit of the doubt to a, to a man versus a woman. It's just you know, part of our culture and part of the biases that we grow up with. One of the most interesting papers I read, and I also have this on my desktop. If anybody wants to send me an email, I'll send it back to you. Uh, was this one about um, letters of recommendation written by these people who are in Detroit, at Wayne State University. And what they did was they looked at 300 letters of application that were successful in getting the applicant a position, they called it a faculty position at a medical school, but I think it must have been some sort of residency or fellowship program. It probably wasn't you know, a, a real junior faculty position. Um, and they examined these letters in great and gory detail. They looked at how long they were. The ones for men were always longer than the ones for women. They looked at the exact verbiage. It's, I mean, it's a great article to read because they have lots of examples of, of, of these, these things that they found. And so they noticed then systematic differences, which is what you see in these two graphs that come out of this paper. Um, what they found was that for women, what was mentioned more often was how good their training was, um, how good they were at teaching, and how nice the application looked. Whereas for men, what was emphasized was how great their research was, how wonderful their skills and abilities were, and what sort of career trajectory the recommender thought they would have. And, and what they found was independent of whether the letter writer, the recommender, was male or female. That had nothing to do with the outcome. And over here, personal life was mentioned six times more frequently for women than for men. And on the other hand, how many publications, how good the CV looked, how well they interacted with patients, and how well they interacted with colleagues was much more prominent for letters of recommendation for men than for women. And I confess, reading this sent me scurrying to my own file <laughs> saying, oh my god, have I fallen into this trap myself. I still don't know quite whether I have or not, but anyhow. Um, OK, so, so as a result then, it turns out that women faculty are paid less, they're promoted more slowly, have fewer honors, hold fewer, fewer leadership positions. We all know this. Uh, about 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more than that, when David Kessler was uh, dean uh, at Yale Medical School, he asked the Office of Institutional Research to conduct a study of faculty salaries. And what came out of that was they tried to, you know, bin everybody by how many papers they'd published, how many grants they had, et cetera, et cetera. And it turned out that the women faculty overall were getting 10% less than the men faculty. And the only correlation that could be found was gender. Uh, he then told the chairs to remediate this. In most cases, of course, the women were paying their own salaries off their grants because this was the medical school. Uh, some of those things got fixed, but I've heard anecdotal reports that now they've slipped back because we're 10 years beyond that having happened. Uh, so 
so it's time to do something again. And uh, any of you who've been reading this know that you know these qualities that in men are good for succeeding in science, succeeding in medicine, often are not considered to be uh, positive attributes in women. Um, okay, now we get to our organizational structures and how we do hiring, how we do promotions, et cetera. And if you think about it, most of these rules were set in place over 50 years ago. We haven't changed too much in the way our institutions are structured. And yet, what's changed very dramatically is what's happening in people's families. Uh, so it's not only women who have working husbands, most men have working wives, and there are different family situations from what used to be the case, and, but, the, but the structures are still set up so that if you have somebody at home doing all the extra things in your life, a wife by whatever sex, uh, you're at a great advantage relative to people that don't have this. So that's something that has to be um, put into the equation and thinking about solutions. So the overall conclusion then of the findings is that there are career impediments for women um, who are needed in the scientific workforce and that we have to do something about transforming our institutions and procedures <laughs> to eliminate both gender bias and try to make the structures more accommodating. And thus, the recommendations of the committee that come out of these findings are very, very broad and touch on, or tried to touch on, all aspects of society that are contributing to uh, the current situation. So what are the recommendations of the committee? So one of the main things that became very, very clear, and I still think is absolutely true, is that you've got to have leadership from the top. There are many instances where there have been a lot of good action on the lower levels by people sort of in the ditches. And if the university leadership, the deans, the president, provost, et cetera, isn't on board, nothing happens. But if you've got leadership from the top, quite remarkable things can happen in our institutions. And of course, what's got to be included is strategic planning, remedying inequities, um, you know, all, all these things are sort of, you know, obvious. And one of the really, really big things is the need for adequate and flexible child care. And this is still a battle that's being waged in so many universities across the country. Okay, then on the slightly lower level, at the departmental level, lots of things can be done. And here, um, one of the leaders is the University of Wisconsin, who, uh, again, with an advance grant, I believe, has put together a, a program that for training for department chairs at Wisconsin, they rotate every three years. It's been very effective in trying to educate people about how you could avoid bias in hiring and promotion decisions. So there are lots of things out there. There's huge amounts of literature, and all this is listed in the appendix to the report. Um, it's got a huge appendix uh, with a bibliography of all these relevant uh, articles and, and reports that I've been talking about. Um, so let's see, uh, mentoring obviously comes under here, although it isn't mentioned the value of mentoring in terms of making sure that your procedures are transparent so that young people coming in know what they have to do in order to get to the next step. And that's good for everybody, not just for women or minorities, obviously. Um, higher education organizations, it turns out that there are a number of umbrella organizations that cover universities, medical schools, and the role that, that these institutions can play is particularly in data keeping. I mean, what you've got to know if you're facing a problem like this is whether the things that you're trying to do work. So you need to track what the situation is this year and what the tra situation is five years from now and see whether there's been any improvement. Um, so that's at least one of the things that these organizations can do. Um, professional societies can do a lot in terms of 
trying to make sure that the representation of speakers at a meeting reflects the membership of their society, that the same thing is true of committees that give out awards. Um, I mean, I'm very proud of the RNA Society because in the last couple of years, it has in fact provided childcare, I don't know about elder care, but anyhow, at, at uh, RNA Society meetings, which has made it possible for people to come and, and bring their children. Um, so there are lots of things that these professional societies can do, and some are much better at doing them than others, and I think thanks to Tim and lots of other people, the RNA Society does very well. Uh, journals, this, this is interesting, and I don't really know the answer here. Um, I've often wondered whether when you, know, you submit a paper, you get it back, and it says, gee, your paper is rejected, and here are the referee's reports, whether a uh, male PI is more likely to pick up the phone, get in touch with that editor, and say, oh, that referee didn't say my paper should be rejected. That referee really said I should just revise my paper. And whether if you look at what the response is to the original decision on the manuscript, whether male PIs succeed in getting it published at a higher rate than females. I suspect they do. Now, I've talked to several journal editors about this, and they say, oh, no, 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 everything's absolutely equivalent. But they also tell me that they have the data, and if somebody wanted to look at the data, they would be able to prove that what they're saying is right. So as far as I know, nobody's, it would great, make a great master's thesis. I think somebody should go out and you know, look at these data from some journal and see what's really going on. And the other thing here is some journals have, um, have done blinded reviews. Not too many in the, the fields in life sciences that I know about, but um, you, can, you can argue that both ways, pros and cons. Um, federal funding agencies and private foundations. Obviously, they need to uh, keep data as to the number of applicants versus the number of awards that they're giving. Um, the reason that this is in there is, well, I was on the committee. I had a postdoc who had a NIH postdoctoral fellowship and NRSA award. And she went off on maternity leave. That was just fine. But when she came back and wanted to use up the rest of her fellowship, NIH told her, oh, sorry, the statute of limitation basically has run out. You've had it for three years, and we can't extend it beyond three years. So she could never use up the rest of her fellowship. Uh, so this is something that I think is being considered for change at NIH. And, uh, and again, when it comes to actually making grants, are people um, you know, looking at what a particular organization is, is doing to try to avoid the sort of thing that I talked about with the Swedish postdoctoral fellowships? And finally, um, it turns out that there's a lot of legislation in Congress already that is relevant um, to this whole subject that we're talking about here, the Equal Employment Opportunity Act, uh, Department of Labor. Um, there's a congresswoman, Bernice Johnson, <gasps> oh, we've got, yes, from Texas, who was actually introduced as a result of this report coming out into Congress, but I think it's still stuck in committee, a bill about this very thing that advocates uh, keeping data, um, having training for administrators, uh, government administrators that are administrating scientific funds to make sure that they avoid bias, and to uh, changing the grants that are given so that if people want to take time off for child giving, they can then get their grant reinstituted instead of having it cut off. So things are, in fact, happening. And I want to go from here to asking the question, well, what evidence that do we have that if all these things were being done, that there would be any improvement? And I think that this graph that comes out of an article written by Nancy Hopkins at MIT that plots the number of women faculty in the School of Science at MIT over this 
span of years is very interesting. And obviously, all of you can see that it's flat here, but there are two pretty drastic in increments. And you have to ask what happened. Um, this one came just after Nancy Hopkins and her colleagues issued the report on women at MIT. And that's famous, and you probably know about that. This one I also find very interesting uh, in the early 1970s. So what had happened in the late 60s was the women's movement in general in the US. And then it turns out that in the Nixon administration, there was a secretary of labor named George Shultz. He also did other things in various other Republican administration. And for some reason, he went back to the Equal Opportunities or Equal Employment Act of 1964. And he told universities that unless they provided evidence that they were going to increase the proportion of women on their faculties, they might lose their federal grants. In fact, nobody lost a federal grant. But you notice that what we have is a real upswing in the number of women on faculties. So there's a correlation there. I'm not saying it's causal. But telling universities they might lose their federal grants is one of the best ways of getting them to act. <laughs> so I suspect that there may be some connection here. Um, so finally, one of the problems is even if women get positions, they tend to leave academia at higher rates than men. And the question is, what can we do about retaining women? And here, again, it's a numbers game. The more people you have, the more likely it is that you'll have people to network with. And I just want to recommend to everybody this wonderful book written by Ellen Daniel about a group of women in the San Francisco area that's been meeting together every other Thursday. And they talk about you know, their professional problems, like you know, what do I do if I have to fire my secretary? Or what do I do if my graduate student just isn't moving ahead? Or what do I do if my chairman has just asked me to teach another course, and I already know I'm teaching more courses than you know, any, any male faculty? Um, and this, as I said, this group has been meeting for a long time. And five, well, four of the women here are now members of the National Academy of Sciences. And it's a wonderful book about how you can network in groups and provide support to each other on a professional level. And I think it really does make a difference, being, having people to talk to about these sorts of things, which is much easier for men because there are you know, many more men out there. So finally, this is, I think, my last slide. Um, you know, this is a problem that we really need to do something about. We have the data in the research literature that points us to what some of the causes are, that alerts us to what maybe some of the solutions might be. And what we need to do now is get together and try to institute some of these changes so that we can really change the situation and increase the diversity of our workforce in the sciences. And luckily, we now have a president who seems to think that science and technology is important for the future. And you know, maybe some of this will happen. But I think that's, yeah, that was my last slide. OK, so I hope I've finished early enough so that we can have a real discussion. Yeah. Although beyond simply higher ed and into uh, women's leadership roles in general, uh, have, have you been made aware of anything like that? I don't. I don't know about that. Does anybody else here know about it? No, I don't. I don't remember even hearing that. Yeah. You know, I, I read something about um, that. I believe it was NIH actually put into effect um, grants specifically for women who had left academia, left research for a while to deal with their families, whatever, and are now going back to research to give them a way to actually break back into I thought it was NSF that was there doing was that. NIH, NIH, NIH is doing that as well. OK. I was wondering how recent that was, and if we are starting to see, because to me, the, the issue of motherhood, whether you're 
a faculty member or not, you know, if you're the woman in the relationship, you're still the one who winds up bearing the burden of really doing more. Yeah. Yeah. So is is that gonna make a big difference? Um, no, I don't know. There are clearly people here who know a lot more about this than I do, well, so there, somebody there else could answer a that. Program. I don't know how successful it was. It was quite, it's quite old. It was maybe 10, I don't know if it even ended, but it was about 10 years ago. Um, but the question, because I think you hit on the key question, which is we change our, we work on changing our policies here for promotion and tenure, getting people off the tenure track for a while. But how do you, we, you know, advising a woman scientist to do this when you know that at the NIH level or at the NSF level, when they're in the peer review committees looking at their work, that's going to be a detriment to them is a huge problem, I think, for institutions that even want to change that. So I, it pleases me to see that the Congress is doing something. <coughs> unless that happens, the universities in some ways are kind of stuck where you feel that you're giving people advice, you know, yeah, just take a couple of years off, but your career, if you can't get back into your career, uh, I don't know if some of the senior other career people here would like to speak to that. I mean, one of the things that this university instituted was if you had a child, you could take a year off, mm -hmm. or, it, but unfortunately, you could take, or you could extend tenure right. by a year, but NIH doesn't give you an extra right. year of funding. Right. So you end up having to go through an additional grant renewal or two grant renewals by the time you come up yeah. for tenure, yeah. which means you have to have actually more papers, not less. Yeah. And the other so, thing that happens, because a number of universities have done this, and it's for men or for women, but people are very fearful of taking advantage of that because then what happens when they come up for promotion is that people look at it and say, well, gee, they've had an extra year. Why don't they have five more papers? So, and you know, and that's a legitimate concern. So somehow we haven't gotten our heads behind these particular um, things that should help. And I don't know specifically about the NIH situation right I, now about reentry grants. But I think your point about leadership at the university level, which is true, the same thing is true unless the universities can do things, but unless the government leadership is there, it's not going to be in sync. And Got to have leadership from the top on all levels. Yes. The NIH, I don't think, is quite even caught up with paternity leave on training grants. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, certainly as a PI of the CTSA, since we are very interested in getting more women into clinical research, we've talked a lot about it. And it's actually not the PIs or the training directors, it's the feds themselves that, you know, say three months and that's it, and that's the most we can be. And oh, by the way, if you Across a grant year, you may yeah. lose it. You'll lose it. So you know, it's, a, yeah. it's a serious issue at the um, at the federal level for federal regulations, and that was a bunch of that was when there were only 24 CQS <coughs> APIs who really got behind it and pushed, and we couldn't make it down. There's, there's some data, and the answer to your question is yes. You know, they're doing all those things, yeah, yeah. Mostly they're not just you know disappearing into the woodwork, and that's the last you ever saw of them. But they're choosing alternative careers. Is there are there alternative careers though where there's sort of an opposite bias where you get a lot more women and a lot fewer men because their careers are more friendly to family issues or whatever? Or I mean, not that I know of. Does anybody else know? Yeah, look for the ones with the lower pay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So one of the recent things that's come out is it, it appears as if at the PhD level, about only two out of ten PhDs actually end up in an academic environment. And so part of the question is, for the 80% that are going someplace else, for which the record keeping may not be as easy as it is looking through the university books. Is it the same kind of bias that's observed, or is that information just too tough to come up with? Well, I mean, as you know, studies have been done on the business sector, on law, 
et cetera, and you come up with all the same sort of, not exactly the same sort of numbers, but the same sort of findings and underlying causes. So it's pretty pervasive. I don't know about, you know, whether if you look at industry or you look at the pharmaceutical companies or you look at the publishing business, I, you know, I just don't know and I don't know if those studies have been done. I don't know if anybody else, do you know? Um, the, well, in business and in law, it's the same. I don't know about some of those other uh, areas, but I did want to comment on your comment about it's easy for the universities <coughs> to get the numbers. In fact, when the NSF started the advanced program, one of the reasons, one of the major outcomes is just the indicators, these very simple indicators of how many women do they get promoted. They found that that information did not exist. And we also found it very, very hard to get here. In fact, we only have now a database of a couple of years because of our But at least you're keeping we'll it. Able, That's great. We'll be able to move forward. But, but it's it, the fact that they didn't have that yeah. data. Yeah. The other point that you made about the, I had never thought about the academic uh, the journals, but I know for raises, and so this is yes. a call to women to <laughs> Uh, when we do salary equity issues, what would happen every year is the deans would come in and there would be this set of raises, but it would turn out that the men would protest. And so if you looked at that as kind of equitable, you'd have to kind of do a second round because many, you know, those squeaky wheels would get more of a raise and that would change things. So it's also true of retention offers. Mm -hmm. that right. Often women will just sort of disappear from a place and there will be no retention offer, mostly because they didn't really go and that's you know, go see the dean and ask for it. Uh, it's appalling, but that's true. I mean, and that has to do with the unconscious bias about yourself as well as about others. Yeah. What can we learn from other countries? You mentioned Sweden. I know that in Sweden, maternity leave is for a year, yeah. and it can be taken by, by men the mother, and by the women, father, yeah. and, and people really do take it in Sweden. But yet, if you look at academia and the roster in Sweden, it's you know just as bad, if not worse, than in the U.S. So, looking at other countries is very interesting. I mean, representation of women in the profession is very much correlated with the, what's the word, how that profession is held within that society. If it's a glitzy profession, then it, there tend to be fewer women. And if it's not highly regarded, and university posts aren't very highly regarded in some countries, and then you see a lot more women. It's, it's very interesting. And I don't know if we learn anything from that. <laughs> well, I have a question. Oh. Yeah. Would, I, I really liked how in the report, at the end of the report, you gave, you gave the suggestion, so what can we do? And you kind of looked at this from the top down. What can we do legislatively? What can we do at the, the level of the university and the deans? And, and you moved your way down. And I'm curious, you, you alluded to this on the one slide that talked about the medical students and the recommendations to medical students. And you said, oh gosh, it made me want to go back and look at my files and see what I had done. So thinking about that and thinking about how you had given recommendations institutionally, what about individuals? Is there, what can individuals do? Can you, because I think you, you so hit the nail on the head. Some of the biases is there and we don't even know. We don't we even have know it. it. And it's right. men yeah. and women that yeah. do it equally. Right, right, right. But I think knowing that this sort of bias exists and just being conscious that, you know, maybe, gee, maybe I'm biased, that helps. You, first of all, you've got to know there's a problem before you can do anything about solving it. Now, in terms of, you know, what we can all do on an individual level, I think we can all try to be more supportive of our colleagues whatever level they're on, and I think that makes a huge difference in, in terms of people thinking that there is an opportunity for them if they do move ahead down this particular track, rather than giving up and saying, oh, gee, I haven't really quite got what it takes because somebody criticized you know, one sentence in my seminar yesterday. Uh, but it's all, it's all very subtle. Yeah. I'm a retired person. 
1978, when I came to this country, I was shocked by the lack of mathematics interest in even in high school children. In California, we started annual math challenge. And institutions like ours goaded the then president to come up with a national education goal. Any of you remember there was a national education goal number four, which said by the year 2000, our kids will be first in the world in mathematics. <laughs> 2000 passed, and the goal also passed. Nothing happened. So the bottom line is, all these reports and similar uh, research concludes various important things. But we, in my judgment, should continue to follow up and not give up. That's all my message. Thank you. Important <laughs> message that everybody has to participate in trying to do something about this and not give up. So John, where would you put your chips if you had to have three uh, changes or three things that you would really work on? It, with all the, uh, the times you've given this talk and talk and thought about it and been on the commission, what would be the things that you would suggest to us? Well, what are the biggies? Wow, that's a hard one. I haven't thought about three things. Or that any, I any do. number of, but where, yeah. where are the real priorities? We could, there are lots and lots yeah. of things that you can imagine, yeah. but what are, yeah. the, what are the keys? Well, I mean, I confess that from the standpoint of leadership at a university, I think it's really important to have both carrots and sticks acting on other levels of the university, the way the university is set up, and that if, for instance, a chair clearly is being biased in hiring, that that person shouldn't be reappointed as a chair. I mean, that's the sort of leadership that you need from a university president. Um, so I think that that's really, really important in setting the tone in our academic institutions. Um, I, wish, I wish I were more convinced that Yale currently has a woman named Meg Gurry, who's a physicist, who's chair of the physics department. She's the first woman ever to be chair of the physics department. And uh, she has been very involved and has you know, made sure that in physics, uh, all the faculty, and particularly the faculty on the search committees, have gotten training in unconscious bias. And she says it's a total failure. I mean, she went into it feeling that this was going to solve all sorts of things, and has come out of it a couple of years later saying, you know, oh my god, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what I can do. Um, so, if there really were effective training programs, you know, getting those out there. I know that, I mean, this is good. I know that the chemistry, the chairs of chemistry departments have a national organization and they meet together annually to talk about, you know, problems in chemistry departments. I don't know if anybody here knows more about this than I do. And one of the things that they have talked about is the underrepresentation of women in chemistry, which is really, really severe in the academic ranks. And talking to several people who participated in, in that meeting, it's clear that you know, their, their consciousness has is, is risen and they understand some of the underlying causes. And as I said earlier, unless you, you admit there's a problem, you're never going to be able to solve it. So that's, you know, that's step one, number one. Um, and, you know, this record keeping of making sure that we know that we've advanced, I think it, on, the, on behalf of all these different organizations, really is important. Well, speaking as a chemist, which has a long history uh, of male dominance, or it's been there for 50 years, um, I think the work life balance issue and the lifestyle is a very hard nut to crack. Oh, I sort of said daycare centers, you know, number one. to have a 
spouse. That's that's very alive and well in that field. And yet the reality isn't there. And it's, so it's been very hard to lay down sometimes. It's really yeah. Yeah. So even some of the young girls. So are there are there data that would suggest what makes a difference? I mean you say everybody nodded when you said daycare centers. Do institutions that have daycare centers have a better percentage of the women advancing than institutions that don't? I mean, you know, I, I was interested yeah, by I, what your I, physicist I friend said. I don't oh know. Oh my goodness, we're training everybody and it's not working. Yeah, oh no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. And I don't know. I mean, I think again, um, you know, having good daycare. Yeah, no, I don't know of any statistics on that point, and that's a really good thing that should also be looked into, see if it matters. So can I address that a little bit, Pam? So I was on the, uh, just, we just finished the President's ch uh, Committee on Child Care Options. We're looking into child care for years. Um, anyhow, there are some statistics in that report that will be coming out soon. And Probably yeah, there are, there are well. data on that. that well, there are. The women it seem easy to get. Yes, there. Mm -hmm. Well, there there are data both in industry and in academia, and you know there, you know I don't think they plot out all of these things, but there are data that women who have excellent, it has to be high quality childcare, not just any childcare. Women who have access to high quality childcare. Are become overrepresented among high achievers at their universities. Oh, really? This is across oh. fields. There are I put a number of citations into that report of some of the best data that I could find. Good. Can I get a copy of this report yeah. when it comes out, please, yeah. Donna? So you'll I, make I sure I get it. it. Yeah. Okay. Great. I mean, we're moving into evidence-based medicine. We should have evidence-based <laughs> decision making. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But another simple thing to do. Um, especially for people that have older children that are no longer in daycare, is to keep some of the more important high-level meetings within um, times when the children are in yeah. school. I mean, that's the number of something meetings that here that go after do. five o'clock or at seven in the morning yeah. Yeah. exclude um, yeah. women yeah. that would like to move up to yeah. into leadership yeah. positions. Um, I wanted to, as soon as I finish this point, point out that this woman here has been trying to get a question out. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, this bright light is coming at me, so I can't see what's going on. Oh, you're right under the bright light. Yeah. So I wanted to, I wanted to uh, point out two things for your friend at Yale. Change um, processes at a university do not begin to take hold until seven years. So mm. expecting that something happens quickly, which is why all of the advanced institutions are making such progress. They have a five-year grant, and that gets you started enough to actually do something in the sixth and seventh year to get something changed. My other point is that you, when um, this woman, oh, it was Mary, if you know that you don't know, then there's somebody that can help you, and that's based out of the Office of Inclusion, Diversity, and Equal Opportunity. There's all kinds of training and all kinds of things that we can do for anybody who thinks they, that they don't know something. We can help you in that regard. But the um, the, all of the, like the, for instance, the, um, the study that you talked about with the recommendation letters, I took that whole study and turned it into a one-page tip sheet so that no one in the room has to make those errors when they write their recommendation letters. We have all kinds of resources available. Right. Okay. Yes, now I see you. Okay. Um, so I have a couple of questions, but first I was just going to point out that I was looking through the literature that was handed to us when we walked in and something I had noticed before because I'd actually read the um, advanced grants and uh, applications and things like that, um, is that I don't see any opportunities or mentoring um, opportunities on campus at Case for postdocs, right? unless postdocs are considered faculty, which I don't think. You know, we have student and faculty um, help, but not a lot for the postdocs. And, um, as far as you know, postdoc goes, that can be a really, really, really important. important. So, are there things available? Some yeah. That's that's a really good point. You're right. As far as I can tell, I think it's kind of been been missed. Uh, we just started developing the Postdoc Girl Association a few years ago, and it's very has very limited funding. It's through the Office of Graduate Studies, 
but something that we can think about. Well, there um, are, in fact, uh, uh, periodic sessions for postdocs about things that we think are relevant right, to right. postdoc, like preparing a seminar, finding a job, that kind of thing. And that has been going on for, what, two years, three two years? years. Yeah. And, I, uh, I, I you know, so I, I think they're pretty well attended. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I, so I do think that's the case. In addition, there are recommendations for postdocs that every postdoc should have uh, a mentoring committee that looks right. after their, um, you know, their science. Now, that varies, the implementation of that varies. But certainly, if you're funded through some of our big uh, K grants, uh, you're not only required to have one mentor, you're required to have a research mentor and a career mentor and preferably a committee, and in the CTSA, somebody looks at that mentoring every six months, and it's written down, and there are things that you, you're supposed to do. So it's a good <coughs> formal mentoring model. I mean, I, I've, been, I've been actually giving some, some talks about it, and you know what, I could call it the mammal model as opposed to the guppy model. You know, the <laughs> guppy model, everybody out there, and you're gonna swim, and you may get eaten by the barracuda, or you may not, but you're on your own. And you know the mammal model is you have fewer offspring, but you really, <laughs> but you really <laughs> try to take care of them. And you know certainly some of the bigger grants for that on which we support postdocs, you know have a great deal of um, intensified uh, mentoring <coughs> associated with them. I I would uh, absolutely acknowledge that spotty, and that you know if you're on some of the big grants. You know, you may be mentored to death or over mentored, <laughs> as in over lawyered or over whatever. Um, which is, uh, you know, actually we, we tend to have more complaints on that side. <laughs> but there, is, there are, you know, these seminars. Uh, Saab has been, uh, been engaged with them. I think Joanne did it before you went off to the NIH. Carol Luke, I don't know if she was here, you know, did a, you know, has really been honchoing that and pushing it uh, forward. But, they try to pick topics that are of use and get people together. The other thing that going to those does is it gives you a community. Because you know, when you're a graduate student, you're part of a graduate program, and you're a postdoc, you go to someone's lab, and you have a, maybe the postdocs in that lab, but you don't necessarily have the community. So even if you don't really care too much about the topic, it isn't, it isn't necessarily bad to go and do that and you know, engage in a community is through Chuck's office find out about some of these programs to try to find a central spot. Our particular advanced grant, we focused on, we had a program on mentoring. We found that was the most difficult in general. First of all, postdocs were not much included, but just for faculty. That's one of the areas uh, for faculty that we think is important on campus. It's very hard to implement. It takes a lot of resources. And there's a mentoring handbook. Right, that's for the graduate right. students, and we are starting that, and that's going to go through USITE, which is the Center on Innovations and in Teaching. Yeah. No, yes. Two questions back here under the... Okay, what? so my second part of that question... Oh. Was that, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> was just that I was really interested in this comment that you never thought you would be a top-flight scientist, and, and I guess my question, or you thought that you might end up a research associate in some man's lab, but um, my, I guess my question is at what point and how did you stop feeling that way? At what point did you know that you had made it? And was that through interactions with mentors? Because I, I remember as an under, or as a graduate student, you know, being in awe of my mentor as, and then at some point him treating me more like an equal mm -hmm. made me realize that I could be a scientist. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, mentoring for women, both from, and, and was that mentor, how did you feel that way? And if it was through your mentors yeah. and your interactions yeah. with them, were they male or female role models? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I'm talking about a different era because it literally was true that there weren't any women professors at major universities when I was an undergraduate and even a graduate student. There just weren't any. Uh, so the times are very, very different. So all of my mentors were men. And they all encouraged me, and you know, I think you know, encouraged me. You know, when you when you talk to most women who've sort of quote made it, you will find, and I feel the same way about myself, that they sort of think of themselves as being exceptionally lucky 
that they sort of stumbled into a couple of fortunate situations and that wasn't really anything they did, it was something that just happened. And I sort of feel that way. Uh, but, you know, gradually, but, you know, I look back now and I realize that, you know, after I was more or less established and I was asked to sit on committees on, you know, all sorts of things, that I would always be the only woman on the committee and I wouldn't say very much, mostly because I was intimidated because I was in such a minority. And I now realize, because now I've read some articles about why it was I wasn't saying anything. There's something called social identity threat that clearly was <laughs> acting on me. And if there had been a few other women there, I would have spoken up and contributed more. I, it's all very, very subtle. Yeah. Let's see. Joanne, did you always? Yes. No, I love one. <laughs> so I wanted to, actually, it was Jonathan who spoke before. Uh, um, sure. I wanted to actually just uh, respond to, to Pam's question a little bit and say I think that the biggest thing we can do from a higher level is hit people in their pocketbooks to modify their behavior. And going to that graph where um, you know, there was a steep uh, upsurge in women on faculty when the Equal Opportunity Act was invoked. Um, both NIH and especially NSF have had a major impact by saying in order to get your grants you've got to do things like broadening participation, increasing representation of women, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I really think we need to hit people where it matters in their, in their pocketbooks. And, and it's amazing how much modification of behavior has occurred because of these criteria. I also wanted to just say that the advanced program, the networking opportunities that have been afforded by, by the ACES program here at, at Case have been marvelous, and I hope that that trickles down to the postdoctoral level. Well, we'll pay special attention. I, we'll do something about it. <laughs> Great. Bye. Uh, I have a, a gifted uh, teenager uh, who's a young woman who's interested in, in math and physics. But between the ages of 13 and 16, she felt discouraged at her school here in the Cleveland area that this would, was an appropriate thing. Maybe it was um, the teacher's uh, supplemental messages or the, the, the peer culture. But it's been sort of a struggle for my wife, Carol, and me to uh, reinforce her own interests and independence. So I wonder to what extent we have a national problem in junior high schools and high schools. Oh, we surely do. And the people who look into our accomplishments in math, yeah. in particular, there's some very interesting articles out there about math accomplishment in the US versus in various other countries. I mean, there's some countries in Eastern Europe where women mathematicians are coming up with all the at the high school level are coming up with the high school prizes. I didn't even know there were these competitions and prizes out there. So it's all very, very cultural, and we're right at the bottom of the barrel. I, you know, I don't know what to do about this. If she's got supportive parents, once she gets to college, she'll probably meet people who think like she does and feel much more comfortable about what her real interests are. Uh, so hopefully you can hold on till then. I, yeah, I don't know what else to say. Came to a summer math enrichment program at Case Western Reserve uh -huh. last summer, which was absolutely wonderful for her. Right. The question back there. Yeah, one of the basic problems seems to be the what many faculty here thought was a punchline in your talk, and that the punchline was because I heard Snickers for it. Academia is a meritocracy. There were barely suppressed Snickers. Now, until we can address that, get people the credit they are due, and, don't, and people that are not due the credit, limit the credit they get, until we address that as, an academic, as academia as a whole, these issues are going to be stalled before they get going. How can collectively science, engineering, and other fields of academia move beyond that? I don't know. <laughs> um, as I said, you know, I think information is one of the most valuable things. And until everybody's aware 
that we all hold these hidden biases, men well, and women just by alike. Well, the stickers that were yeah. to that statement. Yeah. Everybody knows it. Yeah. Well, we when like we to say we're a meritocracy, but everybody knows that we're not really a meritocracy. So what can we do about it? We have to do something collectively about it. But boy, it's not an easy question or problem. You're going to bring well, this to a close. I, I know that it's time for us to end. And I really, this was just a wonderful engagement and presentation by you. And I want to thank you so thank much. You.